How's everybody doing? No, we're fine. Good to hear you, Jonathan. Good, good, good. Sorry, I uh, we've got uh, load shedding where I'm at at the office, and it <laughs> seems to be affecting the internet. So I quickly had to jump on my cell phone. <laughs> Natalie, are we about ready to get started? Yes, we're ready to get started. Fantastic. Can get going. Okay, fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor and a privilege for me to be your MC for today's training. And uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan, Jonathan Heller. I'm based down in Cape Town, sitting currently in uh, Musenberg with a beautiful sunny day outside. And uh, such an honor and a privilege for us to all be joined via this online platform and to be hearing from Fabian. Some of you were a part of last week's training, and I, I'm like really kicking myself or not kicking myself i'm like trying to believe you know was it just a week ago could it have been but it was yeah it uh, feels like so much has happened in the last seven days and it's so great to have natalie back all the way from australia and uh yeah such an honor and a privilege i'm not going to take a lot of your time but what i am going to tell you is that fabian's going to be training us for about an hour up until about 10 o'clock and then after that, there'll be a time for questions and answers. And uh, please feel free, as Fabian's talking, to uh, drop it down in the chat if you've got a specific question that you'd like to ask. Um, you know, uh, Fabian will do his presentation, and then after that, we'll just go through some of those questions. In terms of Fabian, uh, there's a lot that I can say about him, but definitely what you'll discover very quickly is that he has a deep sense of God's calling upon his life. And he's been in the sphere of human resources for many, many years, working for some massive organizations, uh, both internationally and here in South Africa, and uh, is currently part of OM and doing an amazing job with them. Uh, Fabian, I'm not going to say much more than that, uh, but such an honor and a privilege for you, uh, for us to hear from you. And thank you so much for making time for us uh, here at the ACM. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Fabian is going to be talking on how to motivate staff, staff and keep them passionate about the cause. So uh, get ready. Hope you got your pen and paper ready. Fabian, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction again. Um, I've been enjoyed being part of this last three weeks together. Um, and just as I was preparing the other day, I was just thinking of how putting this presentation together has helped me because I've been able to keep thinking the same topics through and how are we doing in organization and reminding myself on, on these things as well. So um, as Gustav said, I think if I look on the screen, I think most of you have been here before. Um, sorry, as Jonathan said, I see Gustav came in today, um, but I think everybody else has been, so I'm not going to do much more of an introduction, um, just to say that I am with OM, and yes, enjoying this topic because very specifically, it very specifically speaks to my heart, that is caring for people, um, caring for volunteers, and seeing how God's work in the kingdom can be established. I am going to click the presentation on. Natalie, if you can just confirm or Jonathan that that's the correct screen. Thank you. Okay, so today we're talking about how to motivate staff and how to keep them passionate about the cause. I must admit up front, as I have in the last two weeks, I don't have all the answers. It's, it's much more um, seeking together and, and hearing from God. So I'm going to share on a few things, but keeping in mind that our contexts are all very, very different. Um, and as I said before, some statements may really be general statements. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go along. You'll know that there's been over hundreds of years theories of motivation. Um, you know the Maslow theory. Maslow speaks of these, these five levels or hierarchy of needs. And it starts with psychological needs. Um, that's the basics of water and food. And then it goes to your security needs of having safety and feeling cared for. 
and then the social needs, um, feeling part of something um, and feeling that you have a foundation around you. The esteem needs, um, these are things where people get recognition, um, they get rewards. Self-actualization is supposedly the goal of Maslow's theory, where he says somebody wants to reach the place we have achieved in life, whatever achieved or success means to them. You've had Hertzberg um, that's taken Maslow's theory and, and Hertzberg sort of split it up into two sections, saying hygiene and motivating factors. And hygiene being all those things that are really physical needs, the psychology, um, security, social needs. And then he says, when it comes to actual um, inner upliftment of a person, he called that the motivating factor. So he separated those two elements out. The other guy that worked on Maslow's theories was Aldefer, and he split Maslow's theory into three areas, existence, relatedness, and growth. Um, so he said this, those basic needs he called are things that you need for existence. And then he said the next level is things that needed relationally. So how you connect with other people and how you get input from other people. And then he said the last, the top end is personal growth. And so you have different views in terms of how to interpret people's needs, but you see that a lot of them have the same type of needs included. Then you have McClelland, and McClelland had a different focus, an achievement motivation theory, um, and where he said people are driven by three main things, a need for power, and in that you can... In, include many things of co control and so on, a need for achievement or success and recognition in there, or a need for affiliation. And that's that relational need um, to network and for people to know me and to feel accepted. The interesting thing about the, the theories of motivation, and there's many more that followed after this, um, is they have very similar concepts within them. They just focus on them differently. What we're going to look at today, as we've done similarly in the last two weeks, is what does this mean in our environment? What does it mean in the Christian non-profit environment, more or less? Um, when you look at these, let's call it general theories of motivation, I'm going to start with a portion of scripture from Psalm 16, and I'll call it a motivated David. If you've spent a lot of time reading about David and, and spend time in the Psalms, you'll know that he goes through many ups and downs, hills and valleys and hills and valleys, and I'm not sure what is deeper than valleys at some times. Um, so this is a time when he's really motivated and, and he's just he's, he's, he's sharing a, a sense of gratitude. Sorry if it's very small there. Um, it says, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. And there's a few things I want to want us to, to stand out, you see highlighted is how is David feeling internally? when he's saying these things, and what is he reflecting about? And so the first thing we see is reflection here in his motivation is, I feel safe in my God. Um, and so one part of motivation is, is, is a safety. Um, I mean, you see that in the general theories, but in, in David, his safety is not in anything earthly. It's not in anything material. He says, my safety is in my God. And he says, you are my Lord. You see, as you go further down, and you're speaking of the people of God, he says, they are noble ones in whom is all my delight. And you see that relational connection again, but you see how that's linked to his inner motivation of what he's feeling. The people of God are my delight. Um, so I'm specifically focused here on what is he feeling internally? What does he say about himself? In verse 5, he says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. In other words, you are the one that fills me up. If I think of 
where I get my inner joy, drive, fulfillment, what fills my cup? You know, we speak of the half empty and half full gloss. David speaking here of his full gloss, and he's saying, what fills my, my gloss? He says it to you, Lord. And he says, you make my lot secure. In other words, this gloss is full and I'm so secure in it because of you. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. His motivation again, the father that is trusting him counsels him. Even at night, my heart instructs me. Before I go further, you'll start to also see that there's different elements to David's well-being that are being addressed. Here he speaks of his heart. Before this, he speaks of his counsel, which means his mind has been affected. Before that, he speaks of his safety, which means his physical being and his emotional state. So you see God um, meeting his different needs. He says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So again, linked to the safety, but not just the safety, but he now speaks to the presence of God with him, that God is there. Um, and then he says, therefore, my heart is glad. This, 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 this gives the outcome of this, what's happening inside him, this motivation that he's feeling inside it's showing in gladness. His tongue is rejoicing. He's expressing outside what he's feeling inside. That my body also will rest secure. I think it's amazing that what's happening in his mind, in his emotions, in his heart, is all now showing out in his actions. His body is now resting secure because God will not abandon him. It says, you make known to me the path of life and you fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand and here he goes and he takes everything he's experiencing and he links it to his eternal life and he says i'm motivated now in all these different ways in every part that i'm trying to express about myself but he says i'm even deeper motivated in my eternal well-being. I am so full of joy and I'm so happy that I have this eternal link to God and I have this eternal joy and pleasure. And um, he, he takes this motivation to an eternal link. And there's so much for us to, to learn from this about motivation, especially for the believer. So, I put this at this point so we can actually in our minds begin to contrast the general motivation theories. Um, and when we look in the word and look at what motivates the believer and try and see what makes the difference. Definitely, a lot of the general theory things that are spoken about, the, the, the basic needs, um, the needs for relationship, um, the needs for recognition, um, achievement or success in some way, they all come across in the believer's life as well. But the important things that I see is the believer's foundation is in God. Those achievements of those things are not in human things. They're not in man. They're not in the organization. Um, and they should not be in self, but they rather are grounded in God and they're grounded in eternity and grounded in kingdom things. That brings the next challenge for you and I is, if motivation for a believer is found in God and not necessarily in human things, material things, why do we discuss motivation and how do we get involved with motivating God's children? And for me, the link is 
how we as an organization, and it goes back to a previous discussion we had before in one of the other weeks, how as an organization we link to God and to his cause, to his work, the kingdom work. When we as an organization are aligned to God's work and soaked in God as our foundation as an organization, our workers, our volunteers will naturally see God in that motivation. Um, and that's a careful link that we got to constantly, a careful foundation we got to constantly keep checking, analyzing, reminding ourselves of. Something that stood out in Psalm 16 is how David was motivated holistically. Every part of him was motivated in his foundation in God. His mind was being touched, was being counseled by God. His body was affected. God was uplifting his emotions. God was giving him joy in his heart. His spiritual foundation was secure in God, even his link towards eternity. Um, and his cares, his life cares were being addressed by God, the things that he's responsible for. And so I'd like you to just take a moment and think of this holistic motivation um, and really just examine for a moment, what does this mean? And take an example of somebody in your organization. Don't speak it out. Don't write it out. I'd just like you to, to maybe let this soak in a bit deeper. If you took a person as an example in your mind and, and think, how do I motivate them emotionally in their thinking, in their body, in their heart? How do I, as a leader in an organization, care about their responsibilities or their cares? And how do I give input to their spiritual foundation holistically? Because sometimes we focus on one element or two elements and we miss the rest. I'm going to give you a moment just to think about it. If we, if, if we had longer time, if we're doing a, a session today, this would be a beautiful time to break out in groups and actually speak through this because this is really something that, that I've seen as, as so important in motivation. And I'd encourage you even afterwards to go back and spend time a bit thinking through this holistic motivation and think, in motivation, am I considering what's happening in the team's minds and how am I inputting that? When I'm motivating them and I'm taking into account that they have bodily needs, health needs, um, physical needs, they have emotional needs, where does our responsibility care lie? Um, I've seen a, a huge difference from working in a corporate environment to working in a Christian NPO. And I'll give you a simple example. Um, if you're in a corporate environment with a thousand employees and somebody asks for family responsibility leave, the only practical way to do it in a huge corporate is to look at the policy. The policy says, Rule A, rule B, rule C, this is how the eligibility works, and this is how you can give it or not give it, approve or disapprove. And that consistency is needed in a large corporate, or else you cannot control the thousands. What I've seen in a Christian NPO is, with the, the people that we have given by God, called people that have sacrificed, it's a different 
group of people. And taking a policy and looking A, B, C, does it apply, may not be the end of the line. And we need to work, how far does my responsibility go? For somebody that has sacrificed their whole life, everything else of the world, um, and they're giving themselves fully to this cause and organization, can I think the same as a corporate? Or do I need to start thinking deeper and actually start understanding what is happening in my worker's home? How many people are they looking after? Who are these children? Do I know their names? Am I cared about what's happening in their home? Do I care that the whole family is sick this week? Has that come? Is it in my heart? So holistic motivation is saying, what level in each of these should we be applying in our context based on who God has given us in our organizations? Um, I'm going to go through a few things around motivation and really First of all, I want to think more on some maybe myths or if you speak to someone about motivating staff, what would be their concerns, especially leaders that say, oh, this is a problem for me? Well, one of the first things many say is, I want to motivate employees, but I feel that if I focus on motivating them, then they, they take advantage. So then I have people abusing the system. If I just move the line a little, they're going to take more and more. And that is a reality in some cases. But something I've noticed over the years in human resources is often it's just a very few individuals that sit on the abuse side of the seesaw. There is a handful. And sometimes we make our policies, we make our decisions based on those few. I'm sure in your environment, um, like in, in our environment, majority of your people are called by God. Majority of your people are actually sent there by God. So I'd encourage us not to make decisions based on the few that abuse the system. What I've done over the years is isolated those few, and I say isolate, not physically, <laughs> in my mind, I've isolated those few and I, and, I, and I set a strategy in how to deal with those few. But dealing with everybody else, I then treat those people as normal, not as in an abuse situation. That also comes in a case where something happens. If somebody steals or breaks into your organization, a quick reaction says, Let's put up cameras, let's control everybody, let's monitor everybody. It's that exact same scenario. If there is somebody that done something wrong, try and find the individual and deal with the individual, but don't let it affect your organization. That's one big way to keep your organization motivated. Don't focus on the negative few. Um, Another aspect that comes about with motivation is if I'm trying to motivate people, does that mean I must keep them happy all the time? So I can't address poor performance. I can't talk about the problems. I can't talk about their errors or, or weaknesses. And I think that is not true at all. I would encourage that discipline actually motivates teams. When, when, when employees in a workplace see correct, well-balanced discipline happening, they actually feel motivated that the organization is doing the right thing, especially if it's done correctly, if it's, if it's done in love, and if it's done according to policy and consistency. And people that are disciplined, we actually do it for corrective behavior and not punitive behavior. So when we're disciplining, if you're aiming for corrective behavior, you'll see positive fruits and motivation. Identifying weaknesses or development areas actually gives room for improvement. It actually helps people see a pathway forward and it helps them see how do I get from this step to the next step. So again, 
it's not the aspect of identifying the development area, but it's how we do it. So as we're motivating, it's not about what we're doing, it's the how we're doing it. Um, I've seen and heard this in many organizations. If mediocrity or poor performance is tolerated, the rest of the team is demotivated. So if we want to grow motivation and we want to grow the level of performance, we need to address poor performance. Um, and poor performance being addressed can lead to high performance teams. And then errors not corrected get repeated and multiplied. Um, so I want to encourage you, don't ignore errors um, and think, if I overlook it, I'm actually doing a good thing because I'm not discouraging the person. In actual fact, when you do in love um, and with a good intention and in the right way, um, correct and show somebody their error, it actually helps them, it helps the organization, and it, it makes improvement go forward. So I'm really encouraging from this slide, don't be caught in the, um, the myth that your motivation is only about positive talk. It's more about having a positive mindset when you're dealing with these things, um, a consistent mindset, and a mindset that's there to develop, improve people and teams. I thought before even speaking about motivation as well is to speak about demotivation. Because you know this from those anybody in financial terms, you can work very, very hard on improving income, but if your expenses are not dealt with, you're not going to succeed. And so if we're going to increase motivation, we need to also recognize there are things that are actually demotivators as well. Just a few examples, and there are many more. Keep a check for outdated and unnecessary rules and policies. So if you see that picture there where it says, keep right, um, it was a good sign um, when the road was working well. But as soon as there's an accident on the road, keep right doesn't work any longer. And so that policy needs to be adjusted for that time so that people can get across the other side of the road um, and start moving across to where they're going to. If the policy doesn't get adjusted, people are stuck. And so sometimes in our organization, people get stuck because we have policies or rules that were created in 1950. And they just don't know how to move past it. So it's important to keep checking our policies, make sure that we're up to date, make sure that people are free to do the work they need to do. Um, I also want to share a, a demotivator that is a very risky one. And this is one where you highlight superheroes, highlight people that are really shining stars. It's a very tricky one. Um, I've seen it in organizations where there's a lot of focus on, on, on people that are actually extrovert, um, outgoing, or in roles that, that show them on the platform. Be careful of placing so much emphasis on those that are seen in the front line that it demotivates the bigger group that are behind the scenes. Um, I think of it very simply from the church environment where we have pulpits and podiums. And sometimes we can clap our hands very much for the person preaching on the stage. But if we do it in such a way that they are the only ones seen, the prayer warriors that are actually the foundation holding up the church, mothers that have been praying for 20, 30 years in the background, might be demotivated. Yes, we can say they need to be looking to the Lord for their motivation, but realistically, we need to be balanced in how we um, give recognition to those seen, to those unseen. I spoke in the previous slide about poor performance. Be careful of allowing poor performance or mediocrity to continue. 
try and address that continuously. Address this unity. We all have different personalities. Um, some people can go in and address things straight away and fix it. Others try to avoid. Especially if you find that you are someone that avoids addressing challenging issues or um, conflicts, where you see disunity, make sure to address it. Even if you use somebody else, even if you use a consultant, even if you depend on others that are able to differently. And I'm losing, using the example there of the house and that beautiful electrical pole. You can see, and this happens in departments, you have the one department working on setting up this beautiful house with the garage. You have the other departments working on the driveway and you have a different department working on the electrical pole. All three are doing a great job. If I look at the house, it's beautiful. If I look at the hallway, it's beautiful. And if I look at the pole, it's beautiful. But all three are not working together. So the outcome doesn't work. Another demotivator to keep an eye out for is what is the risk capacity of the organization? In our organizations, we want to encourage innovation. We want to encourage creativity. As we think of the newer, younger generations coming through, they very much on the top of their mind have innovation and creativity as, as, a, as a high characteristic. And in our organizations, there's that risk tolerance level of, you can see the orange all the way to the red, Sometimes we have a very low risk appetite and we have to see how do we start adjusting that risk appetite so that it allows for room for innovation and creativity, especially if we're thinking of holding on to the newer generation, holding on to people that are going to in assist us in bringing change and staying up to date in the times we're in. That's just a few demotivators, but the point of this slide is please look out for things that could be demotivators in the organization and, and address those things while you're looking at motivation. Okay, a few pointers on motivation as I was preparing, just some basic thoughts. What characteristics would we want in things that we're looking at to motivate? And I think one of the things we'd all want is a long-term effect. We don't want to motivate with things that's going to motivate for five minutes. And then we need to start motivating again. We don't want somebody motivated today and then tomorrow we've got to start the motivation process again. So ideally, as we are looking at motivation, we want to start to say, what are the things that I can do that are going to have a long-term effect in motivating in the organization? And one of the things that's linked to long-term effect is a heart link. Outward links, things that I do on the outside would have a certain lifespan, but they shorter than the things that go deeper into the heart. So what are those things that I can do that link into people's hearts? When I'm motivating, how do I motivate that it is authentic and not just knowing it's authentic, but it is seen and perceived as authentic? When I'm putting things in that motive to motivate employees, workers, they must know this is real and genuine and there's no manipulation involved in this motivation. The motivation must be realistic. If I decide that Motiv to motivate, I need to give money. So now we're going to have to raise a million rand every month. It's not realistic because I cannot raise the million. It must be things that can be realistic, that's going to be sustained in the, in, the, in the plan of motivation. They must be appropriate to our organization. When I motivate, it must align with our um, ethos. It must align with our belief system. Um, and it must align appropriately. I'm going to give silly examples just to make it simple. Giving somebody a Ferrari um, as a Christian NPO is not necessarily going to be appropriate unless it is a small one that's going to fit into their drawer. 
and it has I have loved Jesus written on it. <laughs> it must be contextual. It must be not just appropriate for, our, for organizations like us in our environment, but it must be very contextual to, to our specific environment and who we are, and it must be consistent. One of the biggest things in motivation is consistency. Um, what we do to one, try and do similar to the other. And we never get it exactly right, but try and be as consistent as possible. We've spoken about this. I think it's a bit of a um, repeated theme through these last three weeks is situational leaders, leadership employees are different. And we need to be recognizing that in order to motivate them differently. What one person needs is different to another. I'm sure you all know the Love Languages um, book. Um, some people are, are motivated with gifts. Some people are motivated with touch. Some people are motivated with... Uh, there's, there's five love languages. And understand what is somebody's motivation. So to give exactly the same thing to the same person doesn't necessarily motivate them. People are also motivated based on their maturity, their stage in life, their age, their spiritual maturity. Um, so thinking of somebody's holistic maturity, where they are in life, uh, motivating a single person and motivating a family person is very different. Motivating a 20-year-old and motivating a 60-year-old is very different. So we need to not have one single list of motivation and give it all to everybody it doesn't work. Generations are very different. People's interests and passions are different. Um, I'm sure you've all experienced this over Christmas time when you get the gift from somebody and you think, why did you give me this? And the reason they gave you this is because they love it. It's something they would want not necessarily something you would want. So when we're thinking about motivating people, we need to know them so that we understand what would they be interested in, what's their passion, and then also what's their needs. Um, and we know this in general from evangelism and reaching out. We can go out and take the word of God directly to somebody, but if they're hungry and they haven't eaten for two days, they're not going to hear the word of God. But if I give them a sandwich and then share the word of God, that's going to be more effective. And it's exactly the same with our workers, with our employees. If we understand their needs, we'll be able to motivate them better. Something that we know very well, I'm going to go very quickly through this slide. Some motivators are very low motivators and they're very short-lived. And even in non-Christian environments, even in corporate environments, um, these are seen as low motivators and short-lived. Um, they might have a stronger effect because of the need and the, the drawing outside of a, a believer's life, but especially in our environment, money is not going to be a motivator don't focus on it. Don't make it a, a, a motivator. Status is not a motivator. We discussed this in the first week when we spoke of why people, volunteers, join our organization. They're leaving status to come to us. They're leaving opportunities for fame and importance to come into what God is calling them for, into a cause. Possessions are not going to motivate them. Houses and cars and in most cases, just direct promotions is not going to motivate them. So we know that these are things we mustn't focus on in the aspect of motivation. It's the small things that count. And this is, this is so important as well. When we think motivation, don't think the big things. Don't think, what are these massive changes we can make in the organization? Actually think, what are the smallest things that are significant to our people that will motivate them? 
when somebody joins the organization, who welcomes them? How are they welcomed? What is the onboarding like when they arrive the first day or even before the interviewing process and the connection and the welcoming them and preparing for them to come and having things ready for them? Who's doing that? Motivation starts from before they even joined to the first day they're coming in. We all know this, recognizing the important things, their birthdays, baby showers, anniversaries, and I'm sure you are doing these things already, but doing it in a consistent way. Everything that we do must be consistent. So don't do it unless it's consistent. So in other words, don't recognize somebody's anniversary unless you can recognize everybody's anniversaries or else it becomes a demotivator to others. So if you're doing birthdays, get a system so that every week or if, whenever there's birthdays, you're doing exactly the same thing for people. Um, and again, I say exactly the same, but remember the people are different. Um, the, the card or the message will be aligned to who the person is. The prayer will be knowing their family or knowing their situation. <laughs> Something that's another thought is um, emergency funds. When somebody's in a desperate need, do you have a system to be able to help them? One of your employees' um, house burns down. Do they see the organization caring? And, and sometimes the organization doesn't have the funds. But do we care in a way that at least we take up a collection? Do we reach out to sponsors or donors to assist them, but to show some care for things that are important to them when they are sick, um, when they've lost loved ones? And I know you, you know these things, so that's why I'm going quite fast to it. The important aspect here is these, these small, these things may look small, but these small things count hugely in motivation, caring about their family, their link to their responsibilities, seeing that your employees have a balanced lifestyle. For some, you need to pull them a little stronger into the organization to get more work done. With others, you need to be very strong and draw the line and say to them, please cut off and spend time with your family. I haven't seen you much with your family. You cannot be working whole day, whole night, and whole weekend. Sometimes you need to be firm and push them into rest. <laughs> but all that part of motivation, and then even counseling, having services, it doesn't have to be in the organization, but ways that they can get support. Another thing to think about motivation is the community is also a motivator. Sometimes when we think of motivation, we stop with saying, what can I do? What I'd like us to also go out and say is, what can others do that adds in motivation? Um, use internal, in-person socials for motivation. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are affected by online um, gatherings and changes after COVID. But sometimes we have to drive some kind of connection. Um, and I'm not talking about forced work every day in person. I'm talking about social connection. Encourage teams to get together and have dinners at their home. Encourage them to get together and have a Bible study together. If you can have a monthly weekly, whatever works for you, um, office get together and just have some biscuits and a cake. Doesn't have to be expensive, but those in-person socials are critical for relationships. Um, some people need it more than others, but everybody needs connection as a motivator. In some places, in-person is not possible then make use of online socials, make use of online devotions. If it's between regions, make use of, there are even organizations that have games and fun tools that you can do online. So find ways to have people socializing, speaking to each other, not only business, not only spiritual foundation um, Bible studies, but also just times where they have fun. 
where they just explore and get to know each other. Don't forget milestones, celebrations as teams, farewells, graceful exits. I'm not sure how much time you've focused on that. Try and let everybody or most people, sometimes it's out of your control. Somebody has a conflict with someone and they leave and you cannot arrange a graceful exit, but try your best to have everybody that leaves live in the most graceful way. Um, get people onto your social time when they are leaving. Don't see somebody leaving as a negative. And I'm sure if um, some of your environments are similar to ours in missions, most of our people coming have a long-term goal to live somewhere. So I have someone come in a finance department, but I know they're eventually leaving to another country. I have a family come that I'm so dependent on in certain things, and then I know they're leaving to another company. Graceful exit is not letting people live in a negative way. Try and make it positive as possible. This impacts the motivation of your organization. Try and see if there's ways to have a, a retreat, a camp, an annual one, a, every two years, something an overnight. Um, in our example, we, um, we have um, workers putting funds together over a period of time, and then we arrange a retreat. So they save towards it because we cannot afford as an organization to just arrange it. So depending on your circumstance, find ways for those to, to use community as a motivator. Now I'm going to jump to very quickly some just more creative kind of thoughts, especially around motivating with limited resources. Um, one is using our belief in our workers as a motivator. Sometimes, and in many cases, our people that come in, come in not having a strong self-image of what God has planned for them, not seeing their full potential, and in their head, they may see similar to what you see there, the small lover um, going to become a big caterpillar. They look around and they do a comparison and they see, can I become like Jack, John, Peter, Susan around me? And that becomes their limit. And yes, there's a positive in that they see, oh, I'm going to grow. I want to encourage us to motivate all our people that they can grow to the God-given potential that God has for them, that they must not compare themselves with people around them, that God has a different calling for everyone, but they must not just grow to what they perceive in their minds because very often, and actually almost all the time, we can only see a limit in our mind to where we think we can go. And we limit where God can take us. I can tell you for sure that the caterpillar, if you go and speak to it, has no idea that it can become a butterfly and that it will become a butterfly. And so our people can reach the stars. They will reach the stars. But may you and I be aligned in seeing that potential in them, believing in them the way God sees it. That again means not looking from our eyes and our limited mindsets, but understanding and going deeper to say, what does God have for this person? What's their potential like? And believing that our people can become butterflies, believing that their development areas can grow, that they can take next steps. People are often limited, not by what God has planned for them, but by what they receive around them. The appearance limiting them with statements and unbelief. Their leaders around them saying you cannot go very far. Their leaders not giving them opportunities to stretch further than even the potential they understand. Another aspect in um, using limited resources and being creative is emphasize and use deeper relationships. 
really show genuine care, use empathy. We spoke about this, I think, last week. Use empathy as a motivator. Make sure you really get into the shoes of your workers. Understand them. What are they experiencing? What, what situation are they in? And go the extra mile. If we go back to that picture that I said earlier about holistic areas of looking at the whole person, what are those areas where I need to go extra? And what areas can we go extra consistently and use those areas in creative ways? Motivation goes beyond work. If you plan in your mind that nine to five is the time that you're going to motivate your staff. And then five past five, they got nothing to do to you with you in the afternoon. Then we're not going to get the motivation out of our staff. Because sometimes their need, sometimes their, their, their pain is happening at six o'clock when your office doors are closed. You have to think beyond work. You have to think to their family. You have to think to the holistic person. Another important thing is to hear what's not being said, not just what's being said. Hear what's happening within the life of your worker and then think person first. I don't get this right all the time, but I keep challenging myself on this. Um, if somebody has behaved wrongly, somebody has come in and they've got angry, um, they've they have just, just this negative behavior. There's two ways to approach it. The one way is to deal with the negative behavior straight away. This is not how we operate. This is our policy. This is not our behaviors. Or the other way, which I try to balance as much as possible. What is happening in my worker's heart, mind? This is not my normal worker. Why did they do this? Why has this behavior come out? When we deal with the person first, when we find the underlying aspects, that helps naturally with the outside behavior. I spoke of this already. So, and you remember this slide before, I'm repeating it from last week, I think. These are very critical motivators, is community and teamwork. Um, get people to work with different skills and expertise around them that's motivating. Um, see that there's balanced input. People want to see diversity in the organization between different age groups, genders involved, race groups. Everybody from different diverse backgrounds brings a different type of community and teamwork. See all those things as positive and drive those, those things. Um, use different types of people, green lighters and red lighters, people that are Thinking creatively, people that are looking at the organization and saying, how do we handle these things without causing too much negative effect? Um, make sure not to miss people with potential in the, in the organization. Another theme you would have seen come through in all these three weeks is understanding the shaping of each one of our workers, our volunteers, our employees. Um, but I want to go a step further and say motivated staff motivate each other. Motivated staff, they motivate staff. Again, this helps us not to only try and motivate from ourselves, but to make use of those around each other to motivate each other. Harmonize the way you put people together. Think of an orchestra. If you want to motivate um, the, the pianist, give them somebody with a trombone to play next to them. And if you want to motivate the trombone, give them someone with a bass guitar to play next to them. All these instruments harmonize and they motivate each other. Then you don't need to spend time motivating. They naturally do it to each other. Understand your gifts and get them to harmonize. Link similar hearts together. When you're working on a project and that project is a care project, that has to do with a 
deep care of um, disabled employees in a rural environment. Find people in your organization that have similar hearts. Put them together on that project and you'll see them flourish and motivate each other. Make use of multiple gifting and abilities. Understand them and, and use them widely. Celebrate personality differences. Um, celebrate your introverts um, because of the skills, um, the time they spend quietly um, giving information, finding in the background and adding that to your decisions. Celebrate your extroverts because of their personality and the way they, they share the, the heart of what you do as an organization. Lean on the wealth of experience. So use your staff to motivate each other. Um, focus on personal development. Give them opportunities for growth. Try and have a personal development plan for every single person. Um, develop them in teams. Give them opportunities to get to know each other in different groups. Have consistent appraisals, coaching, mentoring um, together. Do to them as you would want done to you. You know, when I think of motivation, I am a employee, I am a volunteer, I am a worker. And if I think, what would I like done to me? That's exactly what each of your workers would want. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I'm gonna close with this, um, this aspect of maintaining the passion for the cause. We know, and I'm not going to go back into it, we discussed it in the first week, is our people join us because they are led by God in a specific cause, and then they're drawn into an organization that is linked to their cause and linked to their God. How do we maintain this passion? One of the things is they must see the cause as theirs. They must be part of it. They must take ownership for it. Um, if you find in your environment that the cause is the organizations and they are not part of it, find ways to connect them to it that they know that this is their cause. Give them input to the cause. Give them input in shaping the cause as you go along with changes. Let their voice be heard. The cause must be bigger than them or it's not a cause. It's a very definition of the cause. The cause must be God-sized. If you're going to keep your staff motivated, if they're going to stay there, if they're going to be thrilled by it, it must be something beyond them. It must be something that they know they cannot reach themselves, but they reach through God's help, through the connection of others, through collaborations. It must be bigger than them. If your cause is dwindling, it's time to re-examine re that cause. It's time to sit with God and say, Lord, have we been limiting the cause? Help us to see what exactly you want us to do. The cause must need them. If they do not feel needed, they will not stay. So remember, people that are drawn to a cause are drawn to be part of something that is so big that it's, it's, it's not achievable by one person and it's not achievable overnight. And this drives a volunteer, drives someone towards a cause. But they feel that within them, they have something that they can contribute to. Make sure that they know that they are needed and they can contribute to this cause. And this cause must be worth it. All the sacrifice they make to join us all the things they've left behind, all the trials, the persecution, the perseverance that they're going through, the effects on their family, their home, their cultures, the cause must be worth it. Let's make sure that the cause that they are signing up to is worth it. Make sure it's big, make sure they are needed, make sure it's worth it. Summary of some of the things we spoke about, remember holistic motivation, Remove demotivators. Um, treat people differently um, when you're motivating. 
try and be creative around motivation. Don't focus on the natural, earthly motivation things. Um, the cause needs to be owned, needs to be God-sized, must be inclusive, and it must be worth the sacrifice of those involved. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabian. Wow. A lot to think about. I'm sure you'd agree with me, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, yeah, I've got lots of notes that I've made as we listen to Fabian. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We've we've got time for questions, ladies and gents. This is that time where you can pose a question. And uh, if you'd like to pose a question in person, you can maybe just put up your hand, you know, do the thing of put up your hand on your screen. Otherwise, you can type a question in the uh, chat section as uh, the people from Cape Pulpit have done that. So, uh, yeah, I see a hand there, PJ. Uh, maybe you can just unmute yourself and uh, pop the first question and then we'll go to the text question that is in the chat. Oh, thanks, Fabian. I really appreciate it. Uh, my my basic question is, uh, we're a small organization, there's 18 missionaries, and we're all geographically separated, except there's there's clusters of two or three missionaries in different areas. And so those groups do get together, and which is good. But as a, as a new field director, since the first of this year, I've been struggling with how do I care for my missionaries who are so geographically separated, and really the culture of the organization, which has been good, is to allow the missionaries to, our focus is to reach the Zion churches of Southern Africa, and each missionary has a way to do that in their own way, and kind of in their own sphere, but how do I motivate people without um, oppressing and stopping them, but to hold them accountable, you know, you can try online stuff, we have a yearly conference, but like, more uh, throughout the year rather than just at a conference or just here and there? How can I more consistently do that when I'm not uh, with them? Uh, I'll share an example of what we do, PJ. Uh, it's, it's not an, an answer because every environment's different. Um, what we do in OM is we also have regional teams all around the country. I would say continue to motivate your team leaders in those regions. Um, on on the same kind of topic we're speaking now is empower those team leaders to be representatives of you. Um, if if you are speaking one message and your team leader is leading in a different way, then you're not achieving your purpose with, with those teams. So I would say one big focus is to focus on your team leaders and empower them. And then another thing we do is we have a weekly devotion fellowship time um, where Every week, those regions sit together in their teams and they come online in for an hour and a half and we share consistent devotion. We have a time of praying. We have the time of birthdays and recognition. We have a time of praying for the nations. We have our announcements. So everybody is connected in the country through that one session. And this happens every week consistently. So what you're doing is you're not demotivating the regional team leader because they have their responsibility for their team, but then you have a time where it's a national connect that is driving the consistency as well also. Uh, that's one example of what we do. Thanks, Fabian. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Very good. Very good. And then I see Mama Ninela. Uh, would you like to unmute? Uh, if you can, put your video on, but no need if you don't want to. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, because of network connection, I missed maybe 90% of the training. So I'm just uh, asking if I will be able to get the PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank Natalie. You so All right, Fantastic. thank you. Yes, yeah, you should be able to get both the video and the PowerPoint of all of these um, training sessions within the next few days. Mm. Wonderful. Thanks, Natalie. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and then also just uh, a shame the folk from Cape Pulpit had to leave, but there was a very positive comment on the chat. I'm sure most of you have read it. I'll just read it for those who maybe have not. Uh, this was once again a powerful presentation. I am motivated to be a better motivator and less of a boss. 
Thank you, ACM, for the opportunities for growth that you make available to members. We appreciate you. I have to leave now for another meeting. Please send the recording to me. So, yeah, uh, ladies and gents, the mere fact that you've booked for this training session, you will get uh, the recording and the PowerPoint, and Natalie will be sending that out in the next couple of days. Um, and then, yeah, maybe I could just ask a question from my side, Fabian, um, in just looking at some of the notes and, and the things that you touched on. And understanding that we are all, you know, NPOs, NGOs, um, you know, in a situation where, as you've correctly said, uh, money is not a motivator. But what I have seen, for, and and I've been working in this sphere, in this sphere, in these spheres, for a number of years, is that in some organisations, you you find that the people that are really struggling just to meet. Their, their daily needs you know you, you have you have things like you know where at the start of the month because they've just been paid you know you can see that they they may be buying takeaways on occasion but towards the end of the month you can see the budget is very tight you know <laughs> um and so would i be correct in saying that one of the motivators could also be to find somebody who can come and do for example personal finance training with all of the staff or those who say hey i need this would that be also a motivator or would that kind of more fall under the just HR development side? Jonathan, I agree with you. I'd say money is not a key motivator and not a long-term motivator, but money can be a demotivator. So if you think of the demotivator list. And so I would say a part of addressing demotivation is actually to see how can you in your environment um, assist people in terms of, and, and you know, we speak of not giving fish every day, but teaching people how to, how to fish, <laughs> um, giving somebody a fishing rod and taking them on, on the fishing exercise. Um, so in our organizations in missions, for instance, very similar to what Jonathan says, we have um, support raising training, um, people, treating people how to relate to to church members and family how to communicate properly and keep them up to date so and so financial training like jonathan says and there's different kinds of ways to do it um, but some kind of connection to show the empathy and care yes we may not have the money to give you but we understand where you are and we're trying to see how we can relate to that yeah. mm, sure that's very good that's very good Adele, I see your hand is up. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, hi, Fabian. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was a very motivational um, teaching. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, I just wanted to ask one thing with regards to the cause, because um, you're speaking on motivating your team with regards to the cause of your organization, which I think is so critical um, because of the industries that we work in. Um, with regards to that, would it be a good idea or how often should we highlight the cause of the organization or the vision? Or because in order for us to motivate in that space, we would obviously... I think some people and with volunteers joining on that they join all the time and they get a certain amount of training um, but maybe um, it would be a good idea I don't know how often but maybe you could help with this one but how often do you think we should um, make sure that we mention the cause and get you know um, let people know about the vision we've we do have things that show what impacts vision is and what our mission is. Um, but sometimes and some of the new guys miss that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Adele, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I would add to the vision and cause our organizational values. Um, it's for me, values and the mission and vision of the organization is something that should be seen all the time. Um, and, and both of them are those kind of things that you draw up and some people put it away in a, in a, in a nice neat folder in their top drawer, or some people put it on a, on a sheet placard and stick it up on the wall. 
But both those things, the values of the organization or the ethos and the mission, vision, these are things that need to be, uh, sorry, you just said lights go out, but I'm still on. <laughs> these are things that need to, um, to, to be incorporated into everything we're doing so that there's a scene all the time. Uh, because this is what has drawn people there, and this is what will keep people there. It, it's really foundational. And and I would suggest not thinking it from the aspect of, do I have a values, uh, a vision session once a year? But think of, is this actually seen in everything we're doing? When we are presenting who we are is our values is our vision and mission cause coming through in our communication um when we are doing our operational day-to-day -day, is this coming through in our setup so it needs to come through in all the elements of our departments and everything that's happening that that's a full exercise of its own but you you you're 100 on track okay. thanks just thank to you. oh thank you adele great question thank you and do you think this is perhaps something that we need to do as a training session with Fabian? <laughs> Who votes for that? I do. Uh, definitely. <laughs> um, well, I'm great. happy to, Jonathan. Wow, thank you. Thanks so much, Fabian. Um, just in terms of that cause or, or values, as you said, and vision and mission, and then, you know, as Adele also touched on it, I, I'm aware because of some of the ACM members that are in the radio space, um, you do find people coming on board, volunteering or coming on, you know, in a paid position of some sorts that, that do so because they are actually looking for a little bit of fame, a little bit of the limelight, you know, maybe is the right way to put it. Um, and it's so interesting for me, again, because of the many years that I've been involved with various Christian radio stations across the country, um, it's been interesting to see those people and then to see how some of them either get that kind of knocked out of them <laughs> or they end up leaving because it's like, well, it's not quite what I was thinking it would be. Um, how, how does one as a leader within an organization, how, how do you deal with that? If, you, if you're seeing, you know, that this person is pretty much making it about them. Um, yeah. What, what is a healthy way to do so? Jonathan, I'm honestly going to go back to an example I gave earlier when PJ asked the question, because that is really the strategy I use quite strongly for that is I use the weekly get together in our organization as the place where I share the foundations every single week. Um, every single week, I am, I, I am focused on specific themes related to who we are. Um, I'll give you an example. I spent probably three or four months speaking of the talents um, and the speaking of all the topics related to the talents uh, uh, of um, in, in the word of God and, and got accountability linked to that. I've spent three or four months looking at the Sermon on the Mount and looking at the values that Jesus speaks of in the life of a Christian, a volunteer, a worker for the Lord. So, I, I use that as a as my consistent place, but then I also share with the team leaders so that they are in the same heart and same mindset in working. Uh, for me, if there's a consistent message going across, everybody's going to the same place every week. So even the volunteers that are coming in for three months need to join the devotion every week as a minimum, because then they're getting the, the ethos and the values of the organization and know the cause. Brilliant. Yeah, that's very good. That really does highlight that. Thank you. Uh, PJ asked a question, uh, made a statement and a, a kind of a question as well, says, this has been great for me as a new field leader with a small mission that is growing. And I have to desire to innovate and make changes, but I want and need to balance that with the when and how, and I can slash should make these changes. Thank you for the encouragement to love and care for our missionaries. Sure, thank you. That is fantastic, PJ. I don't know if you've got any comments with regard to that, Fabian. Yes, PJ. That's a that's a everyday right. PJ, a everyday challenge of, of a field leader's life <laughs> is the timing of making those changes. Um 
my advice is go slowly, let the Holy Spirit um, give you the confirmation, um, carry the people along with you slowly, don't rush and make changes fast, um, and don't make changes that people don't move along with you. Uh, carry people one step at a time. And you're going to sometimes make mistakes and leave one or two behind and get back and step and pull them up with you. But go slowly. And you're going to get pressure from leaders, your board, somewhere to rush and make decisions. Make sure the Holy Spirit is, is guiding you that this is the time to make those changes. So, Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Appreciate but I, that. I just want to tell you that's going to be a question of every day for the rest of your role. Embrace it. <laughs> Depend on the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit keep giving you the backing. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're getting pressure on both sides. Just keep keep at it. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not just a transition near issue then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see there's a question coming through, a hand that's raised. I think I think it's Sonia. Sonia, yes, we need to ask a question. Oh, have we lost? I do not. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, just a second. Um, uh, just a second. Sonia, um, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Can I go? Can I ask? <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, just a comment on this last um, statement that was made. I think um, for me, certainly being new um, in the kingdom as well as in the ministry, um, it is like what was said at the beginning and now here yeah, to PJ as well, is to just let the Holy Spirit lead you and to keep directing people and your own attention. I think that's the challenge is to keep waiting for God and to keep listening and to keep asking and to keep depending on on God for any kind of a plan or a uh, or motivation or for ourselves first, and then also to keep directing the team um, back to to the cross all the time, um, where it doesn't because easily it can become a, a human effort, uh, especially mm -hmm. especially if you get busy and you get too busy and there's too much to do and. There's all the demands that it does. It can easily become, uh, I'm doing this and I'm achieving this and we must do this. And so that, uh, the, going back to reminding people what the mission of the organization is, I think that falls within what you're saying, Fabian, of, of going back to the Bible. That is like a daily, I mean, we know, like as Christians alone, it's a abiding in Christ all the time, all the time, being busy with, Bible being busy with the gospel um, and that will then naturally I think flow into our work and into that dependence and that is kind of the example that we can also set um, to the people that kind of we are leading yeah so that's a very good um, advice from you <laughs> and thank yeah, I can just support what PJ and Sonia are saying. You know, we focused this last three weeks speaking a lot of our volunteers, our workers. Um, what we haven't spoken of is actually ourselves. And if you are not motivated, you can't motivate anybody. And if you are not spiritually on a solid foundation, you cannot impart a spiritual solid foundation into others. And so we must constantly keep remembering and, and <laughs> trials will keep us remembering as well that we are vulnerable we need to be filled continuously by the word of god um, ourselves so that we're able to give out to others we need to have a prayer network around us people that that um, praying for us we need to have um, advisory network around us i always have um people that are older than me, people that are more experienced than me as an advisory, advisory network. So the advisory team that, 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 I, that speaks into my life, they are all in their 60s, 70s, because they have more experience than me and I wanna keep learning from them. I'm gonna keep tapping into what they have and they're able to challenge areas of my life that 
a younger person is not going to. So always keep building. We can only give what we have. So just agreeing with what Sonia and PJ say, we must get those structures around us. So, so good. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. And even just in terms of, and I, I apologize in advance, my internet connection isn't so stable. Um, but yeah, just what, what you were saying there, Fabian, and, and also during your presentation, I was just so aware of the fact that if we don't make time for those things, you know, make time to meet with those people that are older to advise us, make time for a mentor or mentors in our lives, make time uh, to, to be spiritually growing and connected, make time for our physical aspects, you know, uh, those things, it's it's so, so important. Wow, really on point. Uh, thank you so much. PJ, you've just posted uh, something else there. Do you want to just read that for us, share that with us quickly? Sorry, I didn't want to take away from any other questions. So I just said, you know, I, I recently went on a trip and saw saw a little uh, thing. It says, adventure begins where our plans end. So Proverbs 69, God's hit me over the head with over a number of years now. When I go up to Limpopo and try and God is, I felt like God has called me to the ZCC church back in 2017, which is another whole story. But things have never gone as I planned. And so I think... You're exactly right, Fabian, that uh, we as leaders or missionaries or wherever we are at in our ministry to be led moment by moment by the Holy Spirit. And uh, sometimes it's hard to wait. Sometimes it's hard when our plans change. But to keep to, the easy thing is to, to, is to say we keep trusting God. But how do we live that out moment by moment when when a uh, taxi just about takes us out or whatever happens in our life that isn't our plan? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Very true. Very true. Sure. Uh, something I'd like to also just mention shortly, Jonathan, is just to say we must give ourselves the space to be human um, and to make mistakes as leaders. I think we learn a lot from our mistakes. <laughs> I've learned more from mistakes than probably anything I've done good. So, so, so give yourself space that you're never going to get it perfect, even as we talk of motivating staff and we talk of getting volunteers and looking after them, it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, Fabian, a lot to think about. And I think there's also a lot that we could maybe suggest um, going forward in terms of training opportunities or times of input and so forth so thank you very much for that Sonia one last question from your no, I'm side sorry. I'm I'm sorry I just want to say based on your, again your last um, comment Fabian, about allowing ourselves to make mistakes I think certainly for me oh, I make a lot um, you know and it, it, I'm not I'm not a natural leader so it, it's very hard for me I, I'm very much a uh, I'd rather do it myself <laughs> kind of person. So God is really teaching me to, to depend on him more, to, to help me to manage, manage teams. And I find that admitting your own humanity and your own mistakes and being honest about it and being verbal about it, you know, to say, I don't know how to do this, or I did this wrong, or forgive me for making this mistake to be vulnerable in front of, uh, the people that you work with, uh, your teams, is is really uh, a way of making them, I find, uh, relate better and and feel as if they can then make mistakes and and be vulnerable and you know, yeah, just to to speak our our own weaknesses uh, before God as well and before the people around us. So important because that's what we are. We are all we human, and we are gonna make mistakes ultimately. So yeah, that's so true. Absolutely. Sure, very good. Well, uh, lots of people, the folk from Kingfisher saying we're motivated. Sean saying, thank you, Fabian, for the three-day sessions of valuable training. Your insights and input in inspiring and encouraging us to empower our staff. Thank you for sharing your expertise. And I know that every person who's been a part of any one of the three days of training will echo those sentiments. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Fabian. And before we let you go, I uh, just wanted to say I was truly impressed 
with your musical administrative or musical abilities there, you know, the reference of a piano and a trombone and a double <laughs> bass. Uh, do you play any instruments? Yes, I do. <laughs> I, I, I used to play in worship when I had the time. Um, I play keyboard and guitars and a bit of drums, yes. <laughs> wow, talented on many levels. That's fantastic. Uh, Gustav also just saying thank you very much, ACM and Fabian. This session has been very, very encouraging. God bless you all. And Sonia also, thank you so much, was really very inspiring. I'd like to just uh, uh, pray a short prayer if everybody would be comfortable with that. I just feel that what we've learned and the input that we received, just asking God, you know, to to help it to grow, that it'll find fertile soil, uh, if that's okay with everybody. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you. We thank you for Fabian and for what he's spoken to us about this morning. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person who was a part of this training session. And over the past uh, three weeks, Lord, we thank you that the seeds, the good seeds that have been sown would find fertile soil in each and every one of us. And Lord, that this would not just be a thing for next month or next year, but that it would be for years, that there would be a great harvest of souls, that enter the kingdom of heaven because of what we've learned, Lord, that we would each uh, be able to grow in the areas where you want us to grow, Lord, and that we would continue to be a part of your amazing kingdom. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for your hand of protection upon each and every one of us as we go about the rest of our day. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. A great pleasure. Sure. Fabian, once again, thank you. Hats off yeah. to you for a wonderful job. And uh, thank, you. thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. Keep well, everyone. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye